Do you want to see something stupid? Check this out. How's that for a haircut? Hi everyone, I'm NipFX, but you can call me Nikolai, and today it's going to be you, me, Maurizio Cimaramore, and the state of Project Panama. Maurizio is the lead of Project Panama, which will improve and enrich the connection between the Java virtual machine and non-Java APIs, what we usually call native code. Its main thrust is to replace JNI with a vastly more usable and slightly more performant component. Maurizio and I talked about all things Panama. The project's core mission, the split into four memory and foreign access API, the new tool J extract, performance comparisons to JNI and Unsafe, the interaction with Project Valhalla, the project timeline, and a few more things. Check out the timestamps in the description to jump to what interests you most. Ready? Then let's get it on! Yeah, so I, I have to say that I, my, my, kind of, my background is very similar in a way to yours. I, I used to be a one-trick pony too. So uh, uh, I, I used to work on the Java compiler team. So I did like uh, Lambda expression support in the, in the Java compiler. I used to work on type inference and this kind of problems. So which were really very remote things. from C and C++, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so you, you did really interesting things. <laughs> Yeah, what and happened? I decided to, <laughs> to 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 change things up a little bit, right? And uh, and to start working on the, the runtime a little bit more. And I started more with when when I started working on Valhalla, I started to get more interested into the kind of the method end or runtime part of uh, the Java platform. And then that led me into Panama. So there was this, pro this project uh, seemed interesting. Uh, and I tried to pick that up and to, to, to try to bring it to a, to a good direction. What I mostly want to discuss with you is where Panama is at at the moment, what current challenges were or are, or where you see this, um, where you see what be the next steps. But I think it makes sense to span this from where Java, now I have to actually already say was without, because there are already a few things from Panama in there, but where Java was without, and where you see Java if Panama is all done, and then we can see where you are and what you know. What are the recent yeah. and next steps? So what's the, what's the problem that Panama tackles? Yeah. So uh, I will say that the biggest issue that we are trying to uh, solve here, and it's not just Panama. It's Panama. I would say plus Valhalla because I think the two projects have overlapping, some overlapping, is to try and make Java more relevant for machine learning. And one of the problems that we have when we look at how machine learning is done today, you will see a lot of people programming in Python. There are a lot of frameworks and a lot of very good libraries written in Python. These libraries are very thin and actually they access maybe uh, frameworks written in C++, more optimized, that take advantage of maybe uh, GPU acceleration and things like that or vectorization. Uh, and uh, I think here Java is a little bit of a disadvantage because uh, the pace at which this library evolves underneath is mm, very, very, very rapid. Uh, there is a new hardware coming out every month and there is a new API that goes along with it. So it's not possible to sit down like we did in the old days, try to design an API that will last for the next 20 years and uh, stick with it. What people want to do nowadays is there's a new gadget under the hood. I just want to use it. I just want to use the lowest level API that gave me access to that. And unfortunately, Java here uh, is a bit of a disadvantage compared to other languages that can access native code a little bit more directly. So, for example, in Python, accessing C code is relatively simple. In Java, that's not that simple, and that's because uh, JNI. So JNI is what Java is typically used in order to access native function. It served us very well so far over the last 25 years, I would say. 26, actually. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, has, and, it, has it been in there since the start then? Uh, it's, it, was, it was there in a different form, and then it was changed a little bit to make it a little bit more secure. So at the beginning, I think with JNI, you could even uh, expose Java object as tracts. Mm -hmm. in C code, they removed that because then it would uh, mean essentially making a, a promise about what the layout of a Java object yeah, yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. And so that part was removed in later version. But I think it was there from pretty the beginning. Yeah. So 
It's a very old part of the Java platform, and unfortunately, it kind of shows. Uh, the way you program with this thing is very convoluted. So just to call a simple function like get PID, which is like the C, uh, hello world, like, uh, you have to write uh, a native method in Java. Then you have to run Java C with a special option. It used to be called Java H. Now it's, it's been integrated into Java C. So you, you, you run it with a special option that will pre-process your source file and will generate some side header file on somewhere. And that header file needs to be implemented. So you need to write some C or C++ code that defines the function that Java C has written for you. At which point you have to compile, put it back together into a DLL or a SO library if you're using Linux. Um, and then you have to load that library at runtime, hoping, crossing your finger, that things go well. And if the VM is able to find that library, then when you will call the native method in Java, the thing that will actually be called will be the JNI method. So it's a pretty, yeah. you can see, it took me five minutes just to explain how it works for a simple thing like uh, get paid. So you can see why people are not too keen on jumping on JNI. We have a kind of related question um, by, um, by Michael on, in, in the chat who asks, what makes machine learning so interesting for Java that Java must be able to compete with Python? Uh, I, I think what we'd like to do is to put Java in a place where we can really have good linear, linear algebra libraries written in Java so that people can use those libraries and write their programs in Java that uses this library which uses Panama or Valhalla and then interact with these low-level frameworks that are written in C or C++ or whatever. Basically, we would like to have, for example, TensorFlow is a framework. It's relatively language independent, but there are very nice, li uh, nice APIs for exposing uh, TensorFlow in Python. And uh, the Java API always lagged a little bit behind. So it, it, it is not as nice as the Python API is. It doesn't support all the functionalities. And part of the problem there is exactly because uh, in Java it is so hard to kind of reach down to the lower level. And in other languages, it's a little bit easier. And uh, to be fair, uh, TensorFlow is now undergoing a process. So there is a new Java API that is coming out. Uh, but in general, this problem of uh, trying to interface with kind of lower level framework that uh, power the machine learning today is uh, a big problem. And Java is a little bit behind there. And so I think machine learning is too large and too, too important a field for the future to just ignore. On the one, but also I think it's not, it's not limited to that, right? In general, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of nice to be able to reach down uh, simpler. Um, yeah, there are also other examples. So it's not, yeah, as you say, it's not just machine learning. For example, all the graphic libraries are written in C or C++. So if you want to use OpenGL or I guess Vulkan nowadays or uh, DirectX, you have to use some of these languages or you have to interact with it. Yeah. So for example, Minecraft is using a framework written in Java, which is uh, J, uh, Joggle. Uh, well, uh, and and uh, and it, it uses OpenGL using this library, uh, and uh, there there are also cases where JDK libraries are, for example, implementing zip functionalities or uh, OpenSSL functionalities, and we have very good libraries in the operating system that do this stuff, but we have to rewrite them in Java so that we can write an API because it's so hard basically to. To, to, to just access the library that is already there. So Panama is an attempt to solve some of these problems so that people can just access the library that they want okay, so uh, when without doing all this work. Th that's a nice segue. So if, if Panama is perfect and done, and I want to say the same thing I said to Ron earlier, I know that it's, it's hard to predict the future and that something that might look like a good solution now might turn out in a year or two down the road that it's not actually uh, that good of a solution in the first place. So I don't want to pin you to this. I'm not going to come back two years but you told me on Twitch it's going to be like X, Y, Z. But uh, what do you think is like the perfect... Well, first of all, Panama is like a specific, like a nebulous goal. But also, could you, like, if you already can describe, like, what do you think, how will Panama achieve that goal? So, so first, what is the goal then, of course? And then what do you think will the implementation at the end look like that, that does this? So the goal is essentially to allow you to do whatever JNI can do today directly in Java. So you never leave the ID. You write your program in Java, you use a low-level library, we will talk about that maybe later, 
but you will be able to interact with an underlying C or C++ library. Right now we are focusing on C only using Java code mm -hmm. and method handles, which means your code is going to be able to be distributed a lot more easily than it is today, because today you have to distribute your code shipping DLLs or si uh, system libraries and uh, D distributing JNI code is very hard, and every time. And uh, another thing that J that, that Panama is going to enable is uh, since the integration that we are uh, aiming for is a lot more mechanical than the one provided by JNI. We foresee that there will be more tooling available for developers that just want to say, "Oh, I want to use that library that has that other file over there." So I just run my tool. We have one that is called JExtract, and that will generate all the bindings automatically for me. So from that point on, it's just a source code. I'll check it in in my project, and I'll just work with that, and that will do everything else. So that will, I think, revolutionize the way in which people think about native code. And it will reduce the entry barrier for using some of those libraries. And I think by reducing the entry barrier, people may actually change opinion about uh, what is the cost for doing some of this stuff using Panama, uh, whereas before maybe they wouldn't even consider doing those with JNI because it was just too painful. Yeah, um, and there's one thing that I always like to uh, like to come back in these situations. Uh, like people who watch this stream regularly have already heard this story like five times. Uh, um, uh, um, Linus Torvalds gave a talk about Git at some some event like a couple of years after it was out was out, and he talked about branches and he compared them to, for example, <laughs> Subversion, and he said. Um, well, Git branches are faster, but they're so much faster that you're not just going to do the same thing faster. You're going to use them for entirely different things. And yeah. like with Git, that's like Git branches are a great example. Like you would like creating a, a subversion branch, you would sit down and think, do I need this? Okay, I need this. Let's create this. It pushes that. It's a it's a thing. Like it's it's an actual thing to do. And with Git, it's just like oh, I need to store these two commits. Let's just create a branch for later. Um, so you do, you just don't use the same thing faster. Use it in more contexts because it's easier. Uh, so yes. I'm guessing you're aiming for this as well, right? So basically make yes. not just everybody who, like exactly the people who used JNI in the past will now use Panama and be happy about it, but many more people will be will be will, willing, maybe even me. <laughs> uh, yes, maybe. To, yeah. to, to say, think like maybe that's a thing that I can do easily because I don't have to become like a master of C to, uh, to get yeah, this Yeah, you probably don't have to at least uh, uh, be so aware of all the details that go around in your operating system in order to be able to call a native function. Yeah. And I think that's a big plus. Uh, of course, there are still things that are C-dependent, so that you will still have to know the signature of the function that you're calling and things like that. But <laughs> Come that, on! <laughs> there are things that are relatively simple. But uh, I, I think the pain with JNI is that once you develop uh, a library that depends on JNI, uh, there are so many things that can go out of sync. So, for example, if the native library under the hood changes, is upgraded, and some method is removed or some signature changes, then you have to update your header file, you have to update your C implementation, you have to update the signature of your Java method, and each of those are dealt with, with different tools. And the potential for uh, a mistake somewhere is uh, is pretty big, and here we are basically we only have an entry point which is completely expressed in Java. So upgrading that is pretty easy, especially if you have a tool that generates everything from scratch if the library is updated. Yeah, I was just wondering about that when you said that JExtract creates uh, the necessary things in, in Java. I wondered then with, if I would wrap a, a native library, would I and I could I just generate with JExtract? A Java API that matches that, and then write or Java file that matches it, and then write my the API that I intend to write, the actual API. I would write exactly. that on top of the Java file, and then... yeah, that, that's exactly how you're meant to be using this stuff. So uh, JExtract will give you the low-level knobs that you need to interact with in order to call the, the the native library. But it's not a nice API in the sense that it doesn't really try very hard to look like the C API that it comes from. Because and, and why is that? Because I, we, we think that that's a process for API designers. Yeah. So it's up to API designer to come up with nice abstraction. Maybe not. Maybe if you are writing an API that I don't know 
uh, wants to replicate what OpenGL does, you don't really need to model every call that is inside the OpenGL library. Maybe you can uh, group certain functionality inside objects, or you have more freedom yeah. to mix and match things. Uh, so uh, JFTAT is going to generate the lower level uh, binding that you're going to need in order to call the OpenGL library, for example. But the API is up to you. It's up to you to decide which functions to call in order to get the job done. Yeah, and but that sounds great then because if I have to up, if I update the underlying library, I just run jextract again because once again the old yes. file that jextract created was not valuable to me. I didn't waste any time in it. I can just regenerate it, and then yeah. I will get compiler errors when you know a method disappeared or the signature changed, and then my Java compiler will just regularly just like just like the compiler does will yes. just catch all of these errors. So I got focal support there. Yeah, that just sounds kind of neat that you really have this. Uh, if you pull more of this into the Java system, like in general, I mean, like the job, you know, in general, then in this case, you get the compiler support for for changes underneath. One thing that I that I really hope that will happen at some point is that if this thing get traction, uh, IDE support will start coming in. So, for example, like we have like we have dialogues for creating uh, UIs in IDEs. We, we, had, we had them since the start of Java, like with Swing, where you could basically drag and drop things and create uh, windows and frames. Uh, it would be really neat if an ID provided an interface which said, OK, uh, this is the other file. These are all the symbols that I found inside the other file by using JExtract. What do you want? And, and then maybe you can click on all the symbols that you want, and then it will generate bindings for that particular set of symbols that you selected. So. Uh, that will give you an interactive process to basically do an extraction of another yeah. file. Although I would, I would say, I think, specifically when you talk about updating, it would probably be a good approach to have this step fully automated so you can very easily and without error repeat yeah. it for new versions. Uh, and then, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's then a matter of, I mean, then you have already two good choices. So that's probably two more yeah. than you have now. So that's already better. So how does Panama yeah. get, how does, yeah, if, if Panama is done, how does it do those things? So uh, the, the way it does those things is by creating essentially two new APIs. Uh, an API is, uh, is uh, for accessing memory. So basically, while we were working hard on Panama, JExtract, and trying to figure out how to interface Java with C, we realized that the building block that we really needed was an API to access memory. Java doesn't really have a great API for accessing Office memory. And unfortunately, accessing off if memory is the bread and butter of interacting with native code. So you always have to allocate a little bit of memory, put some values in it, and then pass that data off to, to C code. Uh, the way you do that today in Java is by using unsafe. That's a popular option because it's very uh, no, fast and efficient. Although, no, yeah. why? No, who? No, you cannot use unsafe. Why would you do that? <laughs> well, uh, for for for, the, for that, that kind of purpose is uh, unfortunately one of the best alternatives that you have. Uh, but we shouldn't say that. The second is uh, by, by buffer. You can allocate a direct buffer. Uh, the problem with by buffer, uh, there are two main problems with by buffer. The first is that uh, they only work up to two gigabytes, mm -hmm. so they have a limited address in space, yeah. which was good when the by buffer API was created. But it's starting to show. A little bit of his age now, especially with non-volatile memory coming around, and uh, people really want a long yeah. uh, index in order to address memory. And uh, we can't really upgrade the by buffer API to do that. The second big problem is that by buffer cannot be allocated uh, deterministically. So you basically use a by buffer, and when the garbage collector determines that a by buffer is no longer referenced by Java code. The byte buffer is going to be deallocated. That is good because the user doesn't really have to care too much about how things are allocated and deallocated, but it creates a lot of friction. There are a lot of use cases which require a lot of memory allocation and deallocation where you may end up with, I don't know, four or six gigabytes of memory in the native heap that are used by your program. You no longer need it. You really want to get rid of it. And now you are in this problem. You have to basically ask the GC to kick the byte buffer out. And so you see people starting doing for loops, uh, while true, and uh, call system GC, or try to kick the GC in order to get rid of the memory. The GC, of course, doesn't know that this small byte buffer instance may be tied to two gigabyte of memory mapped uh, uh, to, uh, file. Uh, 
uh, but that's the reality of it. And so one of the problems that we try to solve with the memory API that we provide in Panama is uh, an API that not only allows you to access memory, allocate memory, but also allow you to deallocate memory uh, when you want it. So there is a closed method in our abstraction that allows you to essentially get rid of the memory when you are sure that you no longer want it. So that, that close, I guess, is the auto closable, right? So you can use it and try with it. Yes. Things. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It, it, it's, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, that's that. What you're talking about there is a foreign memory API, right? And it's in six. Yes. So in seventeen, will we have what like its third review? Yeah, we we went through a lot of um, rounds. So it started, I think, in fourteen. Mm -hmm. So then we did another incubation in fifteen and another in sixteen, and now we are basically merging both the um, memory access API and the native access part, the foreign function. Uh, part of it in a single JEP. So JEP uh, 412 contains both the API oh. bundle in, a, in the same package, I essentially. And, uh, and so you can, you can both do memory access and do uh, foreign function calls. So the one API we just talked about, the other one we're going to talk about probably in a minute. Um, but yeah, I was wondering about that. So the foreign memory API was out sooner and went through a couple of previews. And I was about to ask yeah. you, did things change during the preview or did you just want to keep keep the ability to change it because once it's out of preview it falls yeah. under all this backwards compatibility purview and then you can't just be like oh well damn it <laughs> and now i actually yeah. would like to change a few things and now i can't anymore so is it is it like a, in that sense is it a preview in the sense of yeah things did so for those of you who don't know if you create an api you can create it as a um, as an incubator module i think this is it's actually an incubator it's not yeah. a preview right, so it's an incubating api yeah. my mistake right so you have an incubating api which means uh, it's not yet finalized. You have to use some flags to actually use it. Um, it's just for experimentation. And so far, what happened usually is here's the incubator API. Some people say like some things need to change. These things change. So there's, it stays an incubator for the next release. And then maybe during that release, everybody's like, yep, looks fine to me. So then in the following release, so that would be the third one, then it stops being an incubator. And I yeah. observed foreign memory access to be an incubation con like a little bit longer than I would have expected. I'm wondering, yes. was that because it did change? Or was that just because you want to put a pin in it and be like, let's not finalize this before we have to, to make sure that everything yeah. else works perfectly together? The problem with this, with Panama in general, is that the problem space is huge. Mm -hmm. So you have to nail the memory API, but you have not only to make sure that, for example, people that are using ByteBuffer now can migrate to this new API and do a good job with it. You also have to make sure that this API interacts well with the API that does the foreign function. Yeah. So we can't finalize the memory access API until we are really sure of what where the foreign function part is landing. Yeah. And also there was another aspect to it, which is uh, we really did receive a lot of feedback until uh, kind of going out. Maybe I, I use a slightly unorthodox approach here in the sense that I try to get things out sooner rather than later, simply because we knew that the, it was so difficult to get feedback, feedback on this particular topic. And uh, luckily, to be honest, by doing so, people started to try and use this API. And in a couple of um, uh, OpenJDK Committer workshop, we actually came out with very good feedback. So for example, uh, the, the Lucene team try this API and they say, well, yeah, we would like to use it, but at the, at, at the time, the API was really based on the concept of thread confinement. So if you created a memory segment, that's the name of the abstraction, uh, you could only use the memory segment within the same thread that it was created. Uh, there were methods to change ownership and things like that, but it was still single thread. And uh, that was great for us as <laughs> API designer, because we had to worry about less things but it didn't really work out. So there were a lot of use cases that we weren't really uh, able to catch. And when you when we started thinking about foreign function access, it was even worse because of course the C world doesn't have any idea of what the thread owner is in Java. Yeah. So in that case, it's really unconfined and shared and everything. So we had to do through a couple of iteration and in the third incubation, we actually had the support for shared memory uh, access. So you could, you could create uh, memory segments that are shared, uh, basically have shared access. You can access them from multiple threads with races and whatever it was not. And you can deterministically close them, even if they are shared. 
and there is no penalty associated with the with accessing memory. That was a huge feat in the sense that typically, if you think about a memory segment that is alive for some time, at some point it can be closed. If somebody is accessing that particular memory segment, you will think that you need some kind of lock there. Like you need to acquire a mutex yeah. so that you can access memory safely. And then you, re you release the mutex and then if the segment is closed, it's fine. Well, unfortunately, in the case of memory access, if we added a mutex, the cost for accessing memory will be like 100x lower. Yeah. So the API will be completely useless. People yeah. wouldn't use it. So we came up with a pretty neat solution. Some uh, uh, people, uh, Eric Doveblad from the GC team, helped us with developing a solution that was actually using the GC machinery to use a GC safe point in order to make sure that when we access memory, we cannot close the segment at the same time. So we can access memory without blocking, without locks, but still have the deterministic closure of memory. Of course, that closure operation is more expensive in the shared case, but for people that really require that kind of shared access, uh, it's, it's a good uh, capability. And I think after we add support for shared segment, uh, the, uh, uh, we started noticing people adopting the API more. So Netty started trying to do some more experiment with it. Lucene resolved some of the issues that they had with the API. So we, we, we were now in a, uh, in a place where we could start getting real feedback. So now I think the API is in a much more mature state. We are really tinkering with some of the details around the API, but we are not really changing it that much. So right now we are mostly focusing on the aspect that uh, on the fact that this aspect should that this API should play well with the foreign function API, yeah. and that's mostly where we are spending our time today. Okay, so as a last part, as a last comment on the on the uh, foreign memory API that we just discussed, um, because we just, we start talking about it in the context of native calls and native libraries, I think it's very important to point out that using off heap memory is one of the main drivers for people using unsafe. Right, and uh, providing a, uh, an API that replaces ideally all, or at least many or most of those use cases, is actually an important step in you know in, in making unsafe less and less important to the point where eventually in Java 37 uh, it can be locked away from the world and we get rid of that problem. So uh, yeah, I think and uh, I think that's also why it's so important that what, what you mentioned to explain to the, to yes. the uh, viewers. Why it's so important? Why Netty, for example, or or uh, Lucene was dealing with this? I think outside of the context of any native calls, right? Just because they do off-heap memory. Yes, exactly. So the the reason why we have two APIs and not just one is because there are people that are doing mem native memory access, and they don't care about native calls. Yeah. So they only focus about having memory off-heap, maybe because they want to use custom allocators or things like that. So they want to allocate their data of heap and then they want to tinker with it. And uh, in those cases, as you said, most of the time, more often than not, people resort to unsafe. So Netty has uh, its own kind of byte buffer class. It's called byte buff, which is not really based on byte buffer, but is backed by uh, unsafe calls. Yeah. And uh, unsafe has a lot of methods in it to be able to get along, set along uh, at a certain address. And uh, it's also very well optimized. So when you do a call to unsafe to get a long from uh, native memory, uh, if the VM knows the address uh, that is being accessed, the, the call gets transformed into a VM intrinsic. So it doesn't even go to native code in order to do the access. It can just do it directly from, uh, from, from C, C2 compiled code. So it is very uh, cheap and efficient to access memory this way. The only problem is that accessing memory this way is completely unsafe. So you can access not only memory in the native heap, you can also access memory in the Java heap mm -hmm. and start uh, poking uh, at all the fields in your Java classes, maybe even update one byte inside a long field that is in a Java class. So that's really the nasty part of the unsafe access. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the good thing about the memory access API is that by removing the need for people to go down to unsafe, we can maybe in the future lock down this ugly part yeah. of uh, the unsafe access so that at least we are sure that from 
from Java clients, we cannot get access to fields in ways that are not the, yeah. the, the, the proper ones. Because we don't say if you can access final fields, you can do whatever you like. Uh, and that's really bad. So, but that means that you over unsafe the new API offers, um, I assume, right? Better usability. I've looked at the API a bit. So you can actually not, ex it's, it's, easy, it's easy to structure it. So you know what lies where. You can say, okay, this is a segment that it contains points and the points has two ins. And you can just say something easy, like give me a, from the third point, give me that one. So I don't have to calculate like, so, so yes. it makes it easier to use. It obviously, obviously is a supported API, which makes it stable to use across operating system, across Java versions, all of that. But the tricky question in the end is, what about performance though? Do you already know how it, how it compares to unsafe? Yes, yeah, yes. The, the performance story is pretty nice so far. Uh, we, we have been able to, in many benchmarks, to match the performance of unsafe access. Cool. So, in, in most of the cases, all the checks that our API adds, because it's a safe API, so there are checks, for example, for making sure that you are not accessing memory out of the bounds of a memory segment, or that you are not accessing memory after it has been released. All these checks have a cost, but if you are accessing memory inside a loop, uh, we work on a lot of optimization on the C2 compiler so that uh, all these checks are basically oisted outside the loop. Mm -hmm. So basically we do one check before entering the loop and then if C2 can prove that within the loop nothing bad can happen, then basically we go really fast. And in fact, you can even see that the hotspot uh, compiler can even use vectorization in some of these cases to access memory even faster. So we basically get kind of the same level of performance as on save. There are of course cases where we don't, uh, but in the most, uh, most of the time we do. The big problem that we are having performance wise is uh, related to a kind of a long-standing issues with C2 and hotspot optimization that has to do with the fact that unfortunately loop over longs are not as optimized as loops over ints. So since Java arrays have only int indices, the VM is very good at optimizing away all the bound checks that involve arrays. And uh, so it does a lot of calculations about, uh, okay, this index here is just the index there plus a certain offset. So if that was within the bounds, this one is also within bounds. So I would just remove the check. Uh, so the VM has a lot of logic for doing that with int loops. It doesn't have any logic for doing that with long loops. <laughs> because there are no long uh, arrays, uh, arrays taking a long index. So over the last year and a half, we've been trying to slowly teach the VM and with the help also from people uh, from Red Hat, uh, uh, some optimization have been added to C2 so that now C2 is better at optimizing loops uh, involving long variables so that now we can get the same features like loop unrolling, uh, oisting, and vectorization that we can get with normal int loops. Yeah. And uh, without this optimization, of course, this API is a little bit nowhere in the sense that all the loops that you're going to write with this API are, are, are written with a loop, uh, a long variable, because the segment yeah. has a long index. So it's kind of a natural way to, to express uh, your loop. So at the moment, we are a little bit in an unstable situation where we have to use internal in the API in the API implementation, a lot of tricks to tell the VM, well, yeah, this is a long index, but don't worry because the segment is small. Yeah, I was so wondering about that. So it fits inside yeah. an int. <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of internal logic like that, that basically tricks the VM into generating the code that we want. But of course, longer term, we want a better solution and we want all the optimization that we want, that we have for ints to be applied for long loops. And this is important, not just for uh, this API, but also for the vector API. Uh, because also indexing on vector is also using long. So uh, the more APIs are cropping up where long indices are going to be used. So this is, uh, I think, an important optimization for C2 and other VMs. Okay. Yeah, that also means, I mean, I, I guess there are not many lo long loops out there, but it's one once again a nice thing, right, where you start with let's do, let's do native code calls better, but you end up but side benefiting, so to speak, all the people just yeah, do native memory. Exactly. And that yeah. might then side benefiting all the people just do long loops for whatever reason or whatever kind of, you know, a resource really. Uh, so it's kind of nice when you see like sometimes doing one improvement requires you to do another. 
and then you know but but that leaves the you know that leaves the campground cleaner than you found it because you fix things they're not necessarily yeah. like problems but they become a bit more of a problem now that you have a different solution for something else and then that gets cleaned up and you know somebody uh, some other people can benefit of that okay let's quickly go uh, over the second api uh where you actually now we got the four memory set all we now know that um that you can um more easily generate interact with native memory which as you said is important because if you call into c code the c code you don't, probably don't you don't want it to poke around in the java heap i guess so exactly <laughs> so yeah actually one of the big difference between j and i and this new API is that with JNI inside native code, there are a lot of function, JNI function that you can call that are, I would say, as bad as unsafe. So within native code, you can basically access the, the, the Java heap and do whatever you like. There are no access checks. You can break module boundaries. You can access private fields. You can uh, set the final fields after they've been initialized. You can do whatever you like. With this new API, there's none of that, because when you call native code, you are just calling a function in a library somewhere. It's not Java code. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's library code yeah. written by somebody else. It doesn't even know that the VM exists in a way. So what we did is just to create an API that allows you, we, we call it foreign linker API. It allows you to link uh, functions, a uh, function written in another language. And the way it does that, is uh, using the method handle API. So why the method handle API and not something else? The method handle API is a very powerful API, uh, a little bit low, low level, I guess, for that is a little bit like the reflection API. So you get an object, which is the method handle in this case, which allows you to call some method. And in most of the times with method handles, you can call Java methods. So you can create a method handle out of a Java method declared somewhere, and then you can call it. Uh, one of the advantages of the method handle API is that uh, its invocation is much more e efficient than the one provided by reflection. Because, uh, for example, it doesn't have the same cost with respect to boxing. So you can pass an int to a method handle, and that int will remain an int. It will never become an integer and then pass down as an integer. So using a, interacting with a method handle is always... Uh, uh, as efficient as possible. So uh, that's because method handles support a feature called polymorphic signature, which means uh, the client decides what is the signature of the method handle that is about to be called. So how many arguments there are and what the type of the argument is. And they can be primitives, they can be 5 or 10 or 12, and that is up to the, cl for, to the client to decide. Of course, it means that if the clients get the, the, the arguments wrong, so you're trying to call a method handle that has three arguments with five, then you will get an exception at runtime. So our idea here was uh, uh, essentially to have an API that very simply, I mean, it's not a very complex API, this one. It's just an API that has essentially one method, actually two, because we do calls from Java to native, but also we allow calls from native to Java. So there is a method that allows you to create a method handle that targets a, a specific native function. So what you have to do is simply to tell this API what is the address of this native function, what is the Java signature that you want to use to, inter to interact with this method. So for example, for getPid, we know that getPid takes nothing. Hmm. It's, uh, it takes no arguments. And it returns uh, an int or a long, depending on, on, on whether you are on 32 bits or 64 bit. And, uh, and then you have to provide a bunch of memory layouts which describe the, the low-level signature in C of this function. And uh, I, once you provide all these elements, the, the API machinery is able to basically figure out uh, which set of moves it needs to do in order for your Java arguments to be translated into a set of kind of low level, maybe longs or ints or machine words that then get transferred to the native side so that the native function can actually just start using it as if it was called by another native method, but instead it was called by Java. And uh, the reason why we need this low level description, which is not in terms of just Java types, but also in terms of like uh, layouts, is because uh, 
uh, in order to generate a call to a native function, we have to adhere to the so-called uh, calling convention that the C code is using. So we need to know what the C types were when the function was declared so that we can then know how the Java arguments need to be transformed. So for example, if you have a struct that takes uh, two ints in Linux, you can pass this, this struct by register. So you just take the two ints and you uh, put them into a 64-bit word and you pass that by register. Uh, on Windows, this struct is instead uh, copied uh, uh, somewhere else uh, uh, with an indirection, and then the pointer is passed to the function, at least if the struct is big enough. So the Linker API knows all of these moves. It knows about all the different operating system calling uh, platform and calling conventions. So you just specify the Java signature you want, the address that you want to call, and then the C signature, and then it will figure out all the rest, and you just call your method handle, and the magic will happen, and your function will be called. So you, there's nothing else you, you, you really need to do. I think that what I It's a declarative way. Uh, it's a declarative approach in, by which you can interact with native libraries, in a way. When I first looked into the stream implementation, I was surprised by the complexity in there. Well, not really surprised. I didn't have many expectations, but there, there is a lot of complexity in there because it has to deal with, like, it wants to optimize stuff, but it also has to deal with with parallel streams and everything. But maybe the quota from outside complexity to implementation complexity is even larger for what you described, because what you just described sounds like, well, you know, we have to implement this for a lot of different platforms, but still the API contains two methods. <laughs> yes. The, the, in fact, it's pretty fascinating to see that the API is really two methods, uh, one for creating a method handle, and the other does the opposite. Basically, you give it a method handle that points maybe to a Java method, yeah. And it will create a function pointer for you. So an address that you can pass to a native function. So the native function will work. And then at some point, maybe if you call something like QSort, you can pass a comparator written in Java. Oh, nice. QSort will just call a function pointer in C. But wait, this function pointer is not really a function pointer that is associated with a C function. It actually comes back up in Java, and it calls your method handle that was there in the first place. So these are the two like yin and yang of the for a linker API, you can uh, generate a method handle out of a C function description, or you can generate a function pointer from a Java method description, yeah. and then pass it to native code. Yeah. And so with this, you get bidirectionality. Uh, so what platforms do you support then, by the way? Uh... We support uh, Linux x64, Windows x64, uh, Mac OS x64, we are doing some work in order to support also the so also we support ARM uh, x64 as well Linux, uh, and we are doing some work to support macOS on ARM, which is now kind of all, all the rage of course. Yeah. So uh, we are in the loop in order to add support for ARM basically for all the operating system, both Windows and. Uh, uh, Mac OS on ARM as well. Okay. Uh, we don't have support for uh, uh, x86 at the moment. It, it can be added. It's just a matter of writing the... This is all Java code, by the way. So it's not so hard to add a new support for a new platform. Uh, but, but you have to write the support, of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, we've described that for, for memory API, third incubation. Now, foreign linker, I think, is in the first incubation, 16? It's the second, actually. It, was, it went in 16, yes, with the first incubation. So now we are doing like the second round in 17. And you said that, is, and that's, that's both of them together, right? Both of them together. So this will be like a good preview of what the system is going to look like, I guess. Okay, and um, so... What is your, I mean, of course, like if, if people start using it externally and they give feedback that might, of course, revolutionize, or not revolutionize, but, you know, throw over some assumptions that maybe there's a lot of work down the road, nobody ever knows. But from your perspective, from, you know, having developed this, if not, if not much, if, if no feedback comes in that, that has your rewrite stuff, do you think it would then be done in 18? Or do you think there's more work to do and there's going to be more, more incubation for a while? It feels like we found the right abstraction, especially the, the part that is really hard to design is the memory access part. Mm -hmm. The foreign linker part is, as I said, is two methods. Yeah. And yeah. it's kind of, it's a little bit easier. There's a lot of implementation complexity because we have to make these calls really fast so that it can really yeah. go at the same speed as JNI calls were able to go, or even better in case when native code calls back to Java, 
uh, we have been able to improve performances there. Uh, but we think that we have the API nailed down there. For the memory access part, I think we need a big change in this release. So in 17, we are going to have a, a slightly better API for accessing memory with a new abstraction, which is used to basically uh, define the life cycle of one or more memory segments. So mm -hmm. before, basically, every memory segment was defined in its own bubble. What we discovered is that that was a little bit unrealistic. And what often is the case is that you define a bubble, uh, a single life cycle, and then you start allocating inside there. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, with, with the API that is going out in 17, we, I think we got those abstraction in a much better place. So now there is support for defining a scope in which all these segments are going to be created. Uh, there is a way, for example, to have custom allocators to be provided, for example, even to the linker API. So for example, if the uh, C function is gonna return a struct by value, the function needs to allocate memory, mm -hmm. right? Because the struct has to be allocated by value and return to has to be allocated and returned by value to the user that called the method handle. Yeah. So in the 16 API, that just called malloc, allocated the block of memory, put the stuff in there, and return it back to the user. In the API that is going out in 17, there is the option of uh, plugging in your custom segment allocator. Mm -hmm. So you can tell the API, well, you need a segment. Here's how you can do it. And maybe you want to call malloc, or maybe you already have a place where to put your result, and you're just going to use that place, so there's no allocation whatsoever. And with this case, we can uh, regularly beat some of the JNI function, for example, for uh, uh, copying Java strings into native, because we can tinker a little bit with the way in which the allocation uh, happens mm -hmm. and make it more efficient. So I think th this ties up the API quite a bit. So to go back to your original question, my feeling is that we are getting there. OK. Uh, so I'm hopeful that maybe in 18, we may go from incubating to maybe a little bit more final state, like preview, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe do a round of preview. And then if all goes well, yeah. we, we, may, we may promote. <laughs> so that means that you're... Um... I mean, from what we what we said, where we are and where we want to go, or where, well, where you want to go with Panama, um, then it looks like we're already pretty far towards the, the goal, right? Do, or do you think like what what are any up, are there still any upcoming challenges on the horizon? Anything else that builds on what you just described, or do you think that you're about you know about to be done with Panama, wrap it up in in, in a year or two? So my expectation is that, yes, a year or two is a reasonable time frame for the things that we are discussing. Okay. The remaining challenge is, of course, the tool that we have described, which is JSTRAC. We didn't talk a lot, a lot about it. But uh, I guess the challenge there is not much technical in the sense that we know. I mean, now we have the low-level plumbing. We have these method handles. For memory access, we have the var handle that allow you to access memory. So this tool is really only generate, reading an header file and generating all the method handles that you need and all the var handles that you need to access memory inside structs or to access native function inside the library. So we know how to do the tool. And the tool has been uh, working pretty reliably. We did a lot of testing. People have been reporting back. It seems like it's, it's holding up pretty well. The question there, I think, that is left to answer is whether is this tool part of the JDK or maybe is this tool uh, some kind of side project that we put in a different repo so that we can iterate on it a little bit more quickly uh, to update it, for example, when Valhalla uh, comes along. Because we didn't talk about Valhalla much, but Valhalla is going to improve a lot the way in which Panama is going to be used. Because, for example, in C, there are a lot of data types like unsigned int and things like that which right now we just cannot yeah. model yeah. we we don't have a very efficient way to support them but Valhalla is going to give us support for all of this stuff so i imagine that in a, when Valhalla comes out we can upgrade jxtrack to generate a much higher level api for calling your uh, native binding without adding any over because you don't need to allocate memory for doing a Valhalla primitive yeah. unsigned int. You can just allocate a primitive class, and that's relatively cheap. Uh, 
uh, while today we cannot really do that. So you have to use a long or something like that in order to to emulate the unsignedness of the int. And yeah. that's a little bit suboptimal. So the tool needs more work, but I, I think it needs... Uh, uh, we need to decide whether we want this tool to be part of the JDK and be an official tool, or maybe to have it somewhere where we can tinker with it a little bit more flexibly. With, I think one problem is that we don't want JXTrack to be tied to the same compatibility restriction that Java as a whole has. Yeah. Because JXTrack is something that you run in order to generate your bindings. If you never want to regenerate them again, then you don't care. Uh, but for people that start generating bindings three years from now, maybe they want to use the better version of JXTrack that generates the the bindings using Valhalla. So we need to be able to iterate there rapidly and not focus too much on backward compatibility for the JXTrack tool, because I don't think that's important there. Yeah, I think we usually when you talk about compatibility of tools, um, it makes sense because usually these tools like like the compiler and then you know maybe the jar they they, they can somehow like they fit together in like in a larger process yeah. so it's really kind of uncomfortable to mix uh, to mix and match them right to use the compiler from here and then yes. java p from elsewhere that probably doesn't even work so uh they kind of like you have to have kind of have to have all these tools in the same version so you can use them together but it feels from what you just described the j extract this is on its own over there like it doesn't track with the other tools so like there's no really like, there's no need I can just use whatever JXtract version I want. I don't have to have, yeah. for Java 16, I need to use the Java C compiler 16, and I want to decompile use Java P, and you know, if I want to use the module uh, uh, options to jar tool, obviously I need that version. Um, so I need them to be from the same version that I'm working with, but from what you described so far, it seems to me as well that JXtract doesn't, you know, doesn't have that requirement. Um, I have a question though that came kind of actually way yeah. earlier. I hope Michael is still around. He asked uh, whether Panda would also enable to write applications in domains where Java was just too slow and weak in the past. For example, he says digital signal processing. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that particular domain, so I, I, I can't really answer. My hope is that uh, for some of the stuff that we are doing, especially we are going to work on some integration between uh, the Panama API and the, for the, the, the vector API. So there are going to be two sides of things. So you can call, you can probably use the uh, memory access and uh, give a segment to the vector API, and can then do some computation there using CMD. Can can yeah? Can you quickly like just like give the the, the shortest explanation to uh, to vector API because we didn't mention it so far. It was also Panama, right? Uh, yeah, it's under the Panama umbrella. It's been developed by my colleague Paul Sandos uh, and Vladimir Ivanov. Uh, and Joe Rose as well. Uh, the goal of the Vector API is to have a stable API to do basically SIMD computation. So there are these instructions in modern processors. We don't just work with a single, uh, basically 64-bit value. They can actually work on multiple uh, values at a single time. So basically 20, uh, 256 or 512, and you basically do a sum of, uh, I don't know, six values or four values at a time. And, uh, and basically, you in a single instruction, you do four sums. Yeah. And if you use this uh, approach effectively, you can speed up your numeric computation quite a lot. It's, so it's, that's why I was referring to the, uh, to the DSP domain that uh, was brought up in the question. When I first heard about this, I totally fight this in the wrong category. This has nothing to do with parallelization. Like, there's nothing going across CPU cores. It's just like one CPU core no. doesn't care whether it adds a 64 bit long, or two of them rather, or a 512 bit thing that it splits into. I think that would be four of them. I don't know. Uh, no, yeah, wait, yeah. that's six. Never yeah, mind. That's like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eight. yeah. So, like, so it doesn't matter. doesn't care whether it just addition of one pair of longs or eight pairs yeah. of longs. It's exactly, it's just, it's just, you just have to put in the data. Yeah. And um, that's a thing that happens often with loops, right? Where you have a loop that goes over an array and then uh, you want to have every, uh, you know, want to add two ins from two different arrays. And then the, yes. hopefully the just-in-time compiler can realize, wait a moment, that looks like something the vector, that, that, that can be vectorized, but it's not yeah. as reliable. In most cases, 
it works out. Yeah. But it's like uh, it's a little bit like escape analysis and allocation elimination and Project Valhalla. Uh, Project Valhalla is all about making that very reliable and basically surface it up at the programming model. And the Vector API is trying to provide an API that tells the C2 compiler when something needs to be vectorized. And so the vectorization becomes more reliable and uh, predictable yeah. and the performance is going to go up. That can interact in the future. You can have like a native memory uh, element, a segment that you can pass off to the uh, vector API. Yes, yes. And to do some computation there. And the computation, the numeric computation that you can there is going to be, of course, more efficient. Yeah. So I think in a lot of those cases, using the memory access API, the vector API, and maybe in the future, Valhalla together, I think we can transform the way people think about the Java language. And I think that's basically the goal of that this project have combined. So you don't have to think about Panama alone or Palala alone or even Amber in a way alone. It's about making the language more exciting to use as developers when we have records and other stuff and pattern matching. But it's also about making the platform more efficient about interfacing native code in the case of Panama or in the Vector API about having reliable uh, vectorization or in the case of Valhalla, to have, to have reliable uh, elimination of uh, allocation cost or even having uh, basically call uh, by values, where basically we, we, we can have a very tight calling convention inside the VM to pass values around from one function to another. Yeah. So I think what the question was, or I would just guess, I don't know, but I would was intense, intended to be like, Maybe when you do something like signal processing, you can use the, the, the core loop, the, hard, the performance intensive part, uh, that would be a native library. And now with Panama, it's much easier to just use that for that, but write everything else around it that yeah. may be more comfortable yeah. with Java, write that in Java. But what you're saying, well, maybe, maybe not specifically in signal processing, but in general, there are more tasks that once Valhalla has done the primitive classes and, um, and you have the vector API and you have all of that, that then you can actually know you maybe you don't even have to resort to native at all. You can just exactly. try to do it in Java. That's surely maybe you can just do it in Java in full. Uh, if you cannot do it in Java, the, the Panama foreign integration will help you accessing whatever system library you have laying there to, to do your job. Yeah, that, that, that's actually and it will be easier to distribute on Maven or whatever tool you're using, Gradle. That, that's definitely an interesting, uh, interesting perspective. I didn't, I didn't know that about uh, Panama and Valhalla. I really learned something there today. I mean, a lot of the details as well, but that's really interesting how they play together. So, Mauricio, thank you very much. Thank you very much for taking our time of your evening. I hope you have a good thank you. remainder of thank the you weekend. Thank you for um, okay. And so I guess I'll, I'll see you around. Okay, thanks, Bye. Nikolai. Bye. Native code isn't really my strong suit, and so I've never used JNI, and I'm not sure whether I'll end up using Panama's accomplishment but I started wishing I would. Regarding Project Valhalla, which we touched on at the end, on the same stream I also talked to its lead, Brian Getz, and I'll upload that conversation soon, so subscribe if you don't want to miss it. Uh, by the way, I also had a longer conversation with Ron Pressler about the state of Project Loom. You can find that one over there. I'll see you in the next one. So long!